It's not unusual for a minister to write a book about spiritual warfare, but what really got my attention is when I ran across this book, The Principles of War, where a minister came into partnership with a lieutenant general to lay out these principles of war and how they relate to spiritual warfare. My guest tonight, listen, this is one encounter today you do not want to miss. He's authored dozens of books. Many of them have been culture shaking like The Final Quest. He's the founder of Morningstar Ministries. I'm telling you, we're about to receive a prophetic word from heaven, from this great general of the faith. Would you welcome Rick Joyner to our program? Well, Dr. Joyner, this book, The Principles of War, caught my attention, not just because it's another book about spiritual warfare, but because you partnered with Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin in order to write these principles out and compare them to spiritual warfare. I'm really interested. How did this relationship develop with uh, Lieutenant General Boykin? Well, um, you know, I had studied the Delta Force since uh, in the early 1980s. I owned an air charter service and I got, I won a contract to fly or to at least have planes on standby to fly the U.S. Army's Delta Force commanders. Well, when I went to negotiate the contract, nobody would admit that the Delta Force actually existed. Hmm. So I said, well, does the money exist to pay for this contract or, you know, what are we doing here? But it piqued my interest. So I ended up doing a lot of study. Who is this Delta Force? I had a sense that it was very prophetic somehow. Mm. And uh, so anyway, I spent years as much as I could searching it out here and there and learning about it. And it was a remarkably prophetic voice. It has been called by virtually every other special forces group in the world is probably the premier special ops uh, um, you know, force in the world. It is very unique and I think very prophetic of what we need in the body of Christ. Yes. It was a group of people made up mostly of misfits who could not make it in the regular army. They just weren't cut out to be regular army people, but p put in the right situation, they became some of the greatest warriors in our history. Sometimes one or two of them could be equal to a battalion of regular soldiers. They they became so good, so creative, developed their own weapons, tactics, strategy. Uh, they were fighting a whole, they, you know, they were raised up to fight a whole different type of enemy, terrorism, and terrorists who didn't play by the rules. But it became this remarkable thing that I believe inspired the transformation of the entire army, U.S. Army. Now, I say it because after Vietnam, our military was probably the most demoralized hmm. maybe in its history. Yeah. And they had done away with the draft. They couldn't draft people anymore. So, And nobody wanted to be a part of the military. Everybody hated the military back then. But I think some of our most remarkable leaders rose up during that time, and they transformed our military into what I believe was and, and still is the greatest, most creative, most uh, effective fighting force in history. Of course, that was unveiled when the first Gulf War uh, happened, and every, the whole world was astonished at our, our weapons, the excellence of our troops, of our people, that it was just whole new level that really... I think was unprecedented. And I think Delta Force had a whole, a very um, great impact yeah. and was responsible to a large degree of making that happen. And uh, so anyway, when I had a chance, Jerry Boykin was speaking at an event a few miles from us, and I got a call and was invited to come over and listen to him and to meet him. I wasn't going to miss the chance. Jerry was one of the founding members of Delta Force, hmm. and he rose up to command it, commanded it in some of its most famous battles, like the Panama invasion, like, uh, you know, the Black Hawk Down, uh, what is called, you know, was made famous by the movie Black Hawk Down and, and other 
extraordinary things. Jerry was there, and most of them he commanded. Delta went on to command all U.S. special forces and then went on in, into even higher things in our Defense Department and even with the CIA. So here's a man of the, some of the most extraordinary experience, extraordinary knowledge, and uh, I think maybe one of our greatest warriors in this time. Uh, anyway, I could not not take the opportunity to meet him. Well, we just really bonded right up, right away. And we start doing things together, teaching together. And we use, you know, Clausewitz's principles of war as a foundation. And, and Jerry would teach the military application of each of these principles. And then I would take the same principle and use it as an application for business for ministry, missions, virtually any endeavor, even sports teams and all, can use these principles as a way of developing effective strategy, having clear objectives. Uh, they can be transformational with leadership. And Jerry and I have been very close ever since. He came on, he came on as one of our board members of Morningstar. We see him several times a year. We hunt together. Every year, uh, he's just become one of my best friends, but he still is, I think, one of America's greatest treasures in this time, prepared and, and able to help prepare us for the times that we're in today. Well, it's interesting. That's in a nutshell. I cut that really short. <laughs> well, it's really interesting how the book flows between the two of you. It doesn't. It's almost like you're reading one person because the two of you work so well together. And I love, by the way, I believe it's in the eighth chapter of the Economy of Force where you dig into the history of Special Forces and Delta Force, which is a lot of fun to read. You know, inspirational books are a dime a dozen. But books that have information, education, can teach you something, you can learn something, that have eternal impact are rare, and this is certainly one of them. And what I love about this is that this is like a love letter to military history, this book is. You can see that you really love history. Have you always been fascinated with military history, or is that a new development? Well, I grew up on a Civil War battlefield in Richmond, Virginia, mm. I was kind of numb to it. And then when I was 15 years old, I read a, a, it was kind of a historic novel of the Civil War, and it hooked me. So I started studying history, mostly military history for a while, but I've continued that. But I've studied all kinds of history. When I became a Christian, I dug deep into uh, church history and I, I have been addicted to history since I was 15 years old, and I'm reading it all the time, but especially military history, because I believe it is so important for our times. Uh, you know, we have Israel leaving Egypt as a mixed multitude, it says, mm -hmm. or a mob. But by the time they were, they had gotten to the Red Sea, it said they were marching in martial array, which they marched that way throughout their time in the, the wilderness. They immediately, the Lord started imparting to them military discipline, military type training. And I think this is the one aspect of the body of Christ that we are most lacking in today. Hmm. We are basically still a, a big mob. A mixed mob, and but to be able to use uh, military strategy, mili a military mentality that is constantly looking for clear objectives, analyzing the situation, your resources, the resources that are going to be arrayed against you, and how do you accomplish your objective? Things like this, you know, we're told. We're given divinely powerful weapons for the destruction of strongholds. Jesus, you know, we're told he came to destroy the works of the devil. And it says in uh, John 17, the Lord in praying to the Father said, he sent us just as he was sent. Hmm. But where are the strongholds being torn down? We've been in retreat for a long time. And uh, 
So I became really fascinated with, but also hoping to practically be able to implement and help other Christians to implement some of the military mentality that we're called to have as God's army, that aspect of his of what we're supposed to be that is rarely manifested, and uh, that I think it would make us far more effective in everything that we're doing. So yeah, I'm really excited about this book and the way it's been received and people really getting a glance, glimpse of how much having this mentality, understanding mm. the principles of warfare in the natural can help us spiritually. Yeah, this book will renew your mind. We're going to put a link in the description of this video so people can get access to it. But I, you made a really clear point about how in Scripture the Lord seems to have an affinity for people with a military background. Can you show us a few places in Scripture where that's highlighted, and why do you think that is? Well, you know, a couple of places the Lord says, I am a warrior. Yes. He lets know. He is a warrior. We're supposed to be becoming like him. So we have to take on this warrior mentality. I don't think it's an accident that the, the, the one guy who in the Lord said he had not found such faith in all of Israel was a centurion, hmm. a soldier, a military man. The Lord never told him, you need to get out of that profession or anything. You know, when the soldiers came to John the Baptist, not one time did he say that they should leave their profession. He said, don't use it wrongly, treat people right. But, it, you know, it's something we really have to understand. It is a part of the world and the age we live in. We have to have it. And then, you know, who was the first chosen among the Gentiles to receive the Holy Spirit? But another centurion. Hmm. So there's something, and I think as Jesus said to that first centurion, whose, you know, aid or servant he healed, who understood authority so well, and was so, con and Jesus connected that understanding to faith, that when you really understand how authority works, where it doesn't work anywhere better than in the military, more effectively, it releases faith. It's connected to faith. And it's connected to your ability to accomplish objectives. That's so, outstanding. Yeah, the understanding of yeah. authority, of military authority and structure is connected to faith. That's wild. It is. We need some of that. You know, yeah. only about 1% of our citizens are veterans. Ah. And, uh, you know, I was in the Navy. It was borderline military. <laughs> I was in naval <laughs> aviation that even the Navy didn't consider us real military. We were so slack in a lot of our our discipline and all, but I think it, it made me a far more effective person in accomplishing things. And I, you know, uh, I attribute it to the training I got there. Well, you say something in the book, the quote that stood out to me was, there are many soldiers, but there are few warriors. What does that mean for us as the body of Christ? What does that mean in general? What's the difference between a soldier and a warrior? And then what's that mean for us as believers? Well, I'm thankful for soldiers. And listen, we need soldiers, too. Yes. We can't win without the regular army. Uh, but there are some that were just created for warfare. They may not like it, uh, but they were made for it, and they thrive in that environment. In the danger, uh, they understand how to be proactive and engage with initiative and confusion. I had to go through the Marine Corps infantry training to be a part of a ground defense force when I was in the Navy. And one of the first things they teach you, every battle, the main characteristic of any conflict or battle you're going to be in is confusion. Hmm. Nothing's going to go the way you plan, you expect, and it's going to pretty much stay that way until it's over. Just stuff is going to be happening you can cannot expect you have to deal with it. So how to, you know, the military uh, term is to take initiative. You cannot win if you do not have the initiative. Because if you have the initiative, the enemy or the opponent is having to react to you 
instead of the other way around. If you lose the initiative and your enemy gets it, you're going to be constantly reacting to what it the enemy's doing instead of have him, you know, imposing your own will on the battlefield. So this is crucial. And I think to be that way in life, where any crisis we're in, we don't just shut down. We don't shut down because we don't understand it. Can't it. We start to do something. Hmm. We engage. And one of our, I think it was Patton who said, you know, that making the wrong decision can be better than making a perfect decision too late. You know, there's a basic law of yes. inertia that you cannot steer anything that's not moving. Mm -hmm. So even if you make the wrong decision at first, it gets you moving, then God can steer you. Then you can be steered, but you're engaged and you're taking initiative. And in the military, you're told you cannot lose the initiative. You must keep the initiative. Now, let's look at our what's going on in our world today. We have a leadership that is almost completely reacting to what the others are doing. You, so we lose control hmm. of what's going on. And much weaker forces can dominate a much stronger force if they know how to keep, you know, gain the initiative and keep it. And uh, this is the kind of leadership that I think is very desperately needed in our world today. I think we also have a case of many of our military leaders, if not most, are in that position because they've been promoted more because of political compliance hmm. rather than military competence. So you see, have things happen like in Afghanistan. Anyone who really understood any, I think any of our previous great military leaders looked at that how in the world yeah. could something like that have happened to our military mm. where that was possible even? Uh, it, just everything from start to finish, how that unfolded, and we collapsed in Afghanistan. We have incompetent leadership, and incompetent leadership is a judgment from God in Scripture for the nations that turn away from him. He defines that as calling it good, evil, and evil, good, honoring the dishonorable and dishonoring the honorable in Isaiah 5. And his judgment is, I will give you capricious children as your leaders. Wow. And here we are. So the main thing we've got to do to get back on track is repent and turn mm. back to God as a nation. I think it's so liberating, too, for what you just said, people watching, that even if you make the wrong decision, you're building momentum, and people get paralyzed because they're afraid of doing the wrong thing, making the wrong decision, especially in regard to spiritual warfare. But you're just encouraging them, step out, move, even if it's the wrong decision. Get moving, and God can use that momentum. Absolutely. And we've had plenty of examples of that. We do disaster response training. We do certain you know, community emergency response training to our, our leaders in our church. And uh, we had, after the, the last time we did that training, we had two crisis situations that two of our uh, leaders found themselves in right after the training. And they said, before that training, there's no doubt in their mind, they wouldn't have had a clue what to do and they would have just shut down. In both those cases, they got engaged they weren't sure of what they were doing, but they were going to do something. They were going to be proactive. It saved lives. And, uh, you know, I think the whole body of Christ needs that training right now. No question. And, and one of the key points in the book is defense never wins a war. It's crucial. It's essential. Uh, but offense is what wins the war, which is why you also need warriors, not just soldiers. Going back to that, to that point, how do you distinguish between the two? You have the soldiers, you have the people rank and file who are doing their job, but then there are those misfits, as you as you talk about in the book, those special forces, warriors. What distinguishes them, particularly in the church? How do we graduate or move from soldier to warrior? Well, 
you know, that's one of those questions. Are you born one yeah. or do you become one? I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, you know, you some people, they get in the environment. Uh, they come alive to something they never knew they had. Hmm. They become a different person. Uh, these They become the warriors. And, you know, if you ever watch the movie Black Hawk Down, uh, when the bullets start flying, you know, everybody there, the regular army guys, the rangers, most of them, especially the officers, did not like the Delta Force. They didn't like them. What do you think? You're some elite soldier or whatever. That was the attitude of the army at that time towards the Delta guys. But as soon as the bullets start flying, the chaos of battle unfolded, the regular army colonels would go to the Delta force sergeants and say, what do we do? How do we handle this? And the Delta guys, the enlisted Delta guys were running that battle and they didn't, they didn't want credit or anything else. They just wanted to win. They wanted to save it their own soldiers, and win the battle. Uh, but but that's true. There's A warrior will take charge in almost any situation, regardless of rank. Hmm. And I think we have examples, a lot of the most poignant ones in our U.S. Civil War, where guys who did not have the authority took authority they did not have in a crisis situation, turned to battle, that probably changed the outcome of the war. So that's a warrior. Yeah. They're yeah. proactive. They will engage. They proactive. will do something. I think a lot of people right. are finding themselves in the midst, in the heat of this battle, especially in the United States right now, something coming alive on the inside of them. There's an awakening happening within them. And they're, they're not really sure what to do with it because maybe the churches they're connected with haven't taught them or trained them. Apart from The Principles of War, which is a book every single person watches this needs to get a hold of, how can, how can people find that tribe? How can they feed that fire and engage in the war? Well, sometimes it's not easy. And there is most unfortunately a mentality among many Christians that if it's not easy, it can't be God. Hmm. Well, I see the scripture saying the opposite. Look at the incredible uh, trials that every great Christian leader went through before they became the leader. Moses, Joshua, you know, Joshua, he wasn't one of the faithless spies. He was the one of the two faithful ones, but he had to pay the price, the same price that the faithless ones do to wander in the wilderness for almost 40 years before he can enter the promised land, you know, but, but they use their trials. They don't waste them. And that's one of the important things we've got to learn that every trial in our life is there for a purpose. God would not let it happen in our life. If it were not for a purpose, main one being to train us, to mature us, to help us to become overcomers instead of being overcome by conditions and situations and uh, I think we get that mentality. I know when I was in the military, uh, just, you know, any flight that you took, if you were not in combat, you were training. And the goal was, I'm going to fly better this time than, than I did the last time. I'm going to do everything better. There was this mentality and whatever your job was, everything we're doing is training to get better Unless we're in combat, then we better be better. <laughs> you know, or we're going to pay the price. Uh, so I think we have to have that in the church, too, where it's all training. Hmm. And if we get good enough, God can use us, you know, and deploy us into these important issues. As you've dug into this, and again, it's it's a love letter for military history, these 11 principles that are really based based on the Napoleonic era, uh, number one, is is there a particular, as a, as a military history buff, is there a particular error that gets your attention? What's the one that you love studying more than any other? Well, it's it would be a different periods because of the particular leaders. Hmm. Like Napoleon was, without question, one of the remarkable military leaders of history, of all history, because of his strategic 
planning, his ability, which was, most people don't know this, it was based on his study of logistics and how to supply his troops, which he knew, he developed such a system of supplying his troops, getting them the food, the bullets, the cannonballs, whatever they needed for the battle. He got so efficient at that, it opened up strategies for him that were not available to any other general. And uh, because he became so flexible, so nimble on the battlefield because of his logistics. And uh, but he developed that and, you know, was undoubtedly one of the great military leaders of history who ends up fighting perhaps the other one of the two or three greatest in history, who was the Duke of Wellington. Hmm. When they fought on the battlefield of Waterloo, that could have been two of the best ever going head to head. And it the it did not disappoint, you know. One of the extraordinary battles of all of history, uh, in so many ways, with so many lessons. Now I love that period, but I, I love, you know, I was more at home and familiar with the U.S. Civil War yeah. that again had extraordinary leaders in it, mm-hmm. uh, military leaders, military thinkers. Um, you know, some of the best of all time. And they ended up facing each other at times. Uh, So, but these are lessons that I'm afraid we're going to have war until the Lord returns. Mm -hmm. And we see that one of the worst of all is just before his return. So it's something we have to do in this age, but it's all training for reigning. And the age to come, when he will bring peace on earth, And he is going to restore the earth to the paradise it's created to be. But I tell you, learning military discipline, a military mentality, strategic thinking, it can affect every area of your life. I don't think there's a single business leader who wouldn't be much better without knowing if they knew these things. Uh, I know coaches, and we have plenty of them in sports. You know, many of our great, famous baseball players and baseball coaches were in World War II. Yogi Mm. Berra, I think several of the guys landed on (laughs) D-Day. They were there, fought in that, and they come back here. Any crisis they faced from then on was nothing compared to what they'd been through. So they easily handled stress and things like this. They arose to become our greatest business leaders that turned us into the most powerful economic force in history. These were almost all veterans from World War II. They were an incredible resource to us. And I think one of the greatest resources we have in our nation now that's going to end up pulling us out of the mess that we've gotten ourselves in, you watch and see if it's not the veterans who do that. Yeah, so key. And these principles, it doesn't matter if it's business, coaching, parenting, ministry, they apply in every area. And I, I, I was wondering, as I was reading this, they all apply for right now. But if there was one in particular that you felt like needed to be heralded from the rooftops at this moment, prophetically, that the church needs to make sure they pay attention to, which one principle would that be? Well, <clears throat> at this moment, I would say concentration of forces, mm-hmm. which requires massing which means unifying, mobilizing, and then engaging. You know, that is the one strategy that you'll find at at the root of virtually every victory in history. Now, just taking it personally, most of us Christians still have two or three hundred things wrong with us, (laughs) with ourselves. And I think it's the devil's strategy to wear out the saints by having us trying to fight 300 battles at uh, the same time. Yeah. We're trying to fix everything at once, and he's wearing us out to do that. And when if we would just concentrate and focus on one stronghold in our life and resolve we're going to concentrate everything, get the victory on that, once you have a breakthrough in a military battle, the enemy has to retreat. The enemy has lost if you can break through his lines So it's you concentrate your forces to break through a point in the enemy's lines and 
And I think the same is true with us. We get one breakthrough in our life. We'll find out we're getting victory over a hundred other things without even having to fight them. You know, so to me, that's one of the most important and it requires initiative. Hmm. The basic characteristic of leadership that I believe all Christians are called to be leaders. I wonder if you could take a moment. I, I sense that people watching this are going to be be able to relate with the enemy is wearing them down. They're weary with the multitude of battles that they're facing, but they do sense something rising in them. They do sense that there is a warrior within. Would you be willing to pray for them, however you feel led to pray, that that will come out and that they will be able to concentrate those forces, that they'll be able to mass and apply these principles in their lives? Yes, I will. And let me just say this about one good way to recognize a good one to concentrate on. Hmm. You know, it was the Jebusites who mocked David and said, you won't take the city. The crippled and the blind will be able to defend the city against you. Well, David not only conquered them, he made the those who had mocked him into his own stronghold. That became Mount Zion, which means fortress. Well, usually there's one thing that's just bugged us forever. We can't get a victory over it and we're probably the most condemned about it or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it is that's mocking you, resolve you're going to go after that and you're going to win. For now, you know you've got other things you got to deal with, but for now you're going after this one thing. Yes, It's what Paul the Apostle said, this one thing I do. And you go after that and turn the thing that is mocking you into your own stronghold, your own fortress. And Lord, I just ask for all of those who see this broadcast, yes, Jesus. Lord, that we ask you, you're the captain of the host. You're the greatest military leader that will ever be, the greatest leader. You've called us to be like you, though, to become like you and do the works that you do. And Lord, we ask for that. We ask you for the strongholds that are still holding us back in any way, humiliating us, mocking us. Lord, we, we ask you for the total victory, hmm. not just a victory, total defeat of that enemy in our life, and that that weakness would become, like Paul the Apostle wrote, would become our strength. And you, our weaknesses are made strong. Lord, I ask that for everyone who's listening to this, that there would be a resolve and an initiative I'm going to fight this enemy. I'm going to win, and it's not going to win over me anymore. Mm. And Lord, we ask you for for the 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 whatever we need to do that, whatever knowledge we need, whatever friends we need, whatever leadership we need, Lord, whatever we need for the victory, we look to you as our shepherd, as our teacher, and as our captain for the victory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, if you receive that, just write in the comments, I receive. And let me say something to the audience right now. This is a book, and combined with another one, I hope we'll have time to speak with him about The Principles of War and another one he's got out called Marxism's Strategy for Destroying America. They are key for where we are right now in the body of Christ. You need to read it. But I want every single one of you, go to EncounterToday.com, and let's sow into this ministry gift for being, being with us today, for sharing this tremendous wisdom. Let's be a blessing to this ministry. And I believe as you sow into it, you'll be able to receive from that anointing as well. Dr. Joyner, we can't thank you enough for being with us on Encounter today. This has really been amazing. Well, I have certainly been blessed by being with you. So well, we're neighbors. Let's get together. Yeah, let's do it live. Let's do it live next time, face to face. Okay. That'd be great. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. For all of you that are joining us online, the links for these books are in the description. Make sure you avail yourself to those resources as well as links for his ministry. Morningstar is there as well. Take advantage of it, and we'll see you next time right here on Encounter Today. <laughs>